Welcome to MedTech Speed to Data, a KeyTech podcast. I'm your host, Andy Rogers, VP of Business Development at KeyTech. Each month, me and a KeyTecher are going to interview a MedTech leader and talk to them about the critical data-driven decisions they make in their programs. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to MedTech Speed to Data. I'm your host, Andy Rogers, back again. Uh, today, our guest is Mustafa Aladami from uh, Aztec Diagnostics. Mustafa, hey, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And thank you for saying my last name properly. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that happened. It just, you know, just I'm good at pronunciating. So um, very excited to have another local uh, guest here on the show. So Mustafa, can you provide background on, you know, just your, your you know, professional background training and, and kind of where the idea for Aztec Diagnostics came from? Well, so... I have a PhD in biomedical engineering. Really, it was mechanical engineering with a focus on blood hemodynamics. Um, so I stared at blood for, for, for years. And one big challenge when you're working with blood, try to find bacteria in it especially, is how can I find these 10 colonies of bacteria in this like billions and billions of red blood cells? So that was kind of my research thesis. And then with, with, with my mentors, we're trying to detect uh, the bacteria in blood. Um, but then... About two months before I was set to graduate, my grandfather uh, got sick, and he had a UTI. It's a urinary tract infection, and he needed to treat that with antibiotics. It took doctors four days to tell him what antibiotic he should be taking. In the meantime, he was in pain. He was delirious. He fell. He broke his hip. And I kid you not, he was a young 87-year-old doing walks and very healthy. Within one week, he was a much, much older, bedridden 87-year-old. And helping with his care, I was like, well, if we were able to give him the proper antibiotic right away, we would not be here right now. So at Aztec, we're developing a one-hour antibiotic sensitivity test. So directly from the patient's sample, we know what antibiotic the patient should be taking without having to wait three days for the culture. Got it. So yeah, a lot to talk through there. I just want to uh, understand your story a little bit more. So you're about to graduate uh, with a PhD and you know your relative had this had this challenge. So, were you thinking of forming a company already, or did the need just present itself, and it was just such a clear need for for you personally, and then of course, you know, for the global population to just make this shift? Right. So, I had to make a decision. I had a couple of offers to teach to become you know like on a professor track, and I thought I wanted to start a company, but I wasn't sure. I had done one pitch and that pitch, they did not even discuss what I was building. All they said was, you are not good enough to build something this ambitious. But then when this happened to my grandfather, it was clear to me that, well, there's a problem that now I'm obsessed with. This will be a great reason to wake up every single morning and go to work. And that was really the trigger for me to actually found Aztec. But the idea was, there be slightly before. Got it. Okay. So, so Aztec is focused on diagnosing a, a UTI, right? And then providing a read for antibiotic susceptibility, right? Can you just describe that a little bit more for our yeah. audience? Well, so just to start it, so we can do virtually any sample, right? So we have panels for urine, blood, CSF, and wound exudate. Everyone, all these panels are have some kind of support. Our most advanced one is the urinary tract infection panel. Now, so let's think about a patient. And when they first go, uh, when they, you know, they have some kind of symptoms, they go see a doctor. And about 8 million Americans in the case of UTI, right? They go see a doctor, but everyone gets the same antibiotic. They either give you Bactrim or they give you Nitro. Nothing else. And 47% of the time, this is not even the proper antibiotic to treat the patient with. So that leads to complications. So a simple cystitis, simple UTI could become a complicated UTI. You could take it one step further and it could become, you know, polynephritis, kidney uh, disease, or even sometimes it becomes sepsis. Sepsis is the leading cause of death in U.S. hospitals. And 25% of sepsis starts as a UTI. So the only test that we have right now is, is the culture that takes three days. And before that, we have a dipstick that tell physicians whether there is a UTI or not. Um, and it's such a bad 
test that it always come, comes back positive, which leads to overprescription of antibiotics. Overprescribing antibiotics means antibiotic resistance. So the guess that we're making right now, treating patients with antibiotics that might or might not work, will only get harder as we move on, as antibiotic resistance keeps going. And at Aztec, we're set to tackle the problem at its origin, which is, you know, let's treat with proper narrow neurospectrum antibiotic so we don't have to deal with harder decisions in the future. Yeah. Uh, it's a definitely a pressing clinical need. So, um, so, so for our audience, you, you talked a lot about, you know, detecting uh, diagnosing UTI and, but it's, it's applicable for blood and uh, plasma and other inputs. Um, talk to us a little bit about the platform itself and, um, you know, what your vision at Aztec is for, for how this platform, how and where this platform will be, will be used. Right. So our first rollout, which is set to be mid 2025 will be, um, only the urine panel. So um, the way this device works is you buy an instrument for cheap. And then uh, for every test you want to run, you need a cartridge. So it's this razor, razor blade uh, model. The first rollout is where we found the biggest need for this technology, which is urology practices and, you know, fem health, right? So, so OBs would really benefit uh, from, from our technology. Once we have kind of foot in the door with these early pilots at urology practices, we will then, you know, expand into hospitals. And I, uh, we have about three hospitals that already signed up uh, to become an early adopter. Once this is kind of widely accepted within labs, we will get a CLIA waiver so we could be point of care patient side, um, whether that would be in, in ERs or, or even primary care uh, facilities. Got it. So, so where are you currently in, in developing this platform? Now you said mid 2025, you're yeah. looking to launch. Absolutely. So right now we have a tabletop platform that, you know, bits and pieces that we test and we've achieved over 95% accuracy. So over 97% specificity, 94% sensitivity. And for us, that was the trigger that, Hey, we need to go to go full speed ahead in, in building this platform. And, you know, with the help of, Key tech, we're building our alpha. It's supposed to be ready within two months. Once we have the alpha, we're going to do just quick feasibility studies and uh, get the beta. The beta is the one that we would do clinical trials with. Uh, we need very short clinical trials. It's going to take about a month, month and a half to finish that. Once we have that, uh, we plan to submit to the FDA by uh, Q2 2025, the latest. And this should take 120 days to, to get the approval for. Yeah. Awesome. When did you found the company? I just want to, um, for our audience to understand, you know, the idea and here we are, you know, getting towards yeah. launch in 2025. How long did it take? The official start date is, is May 23rd, 2021. This was the official okay. incorporation. What date. time of day? Jeez, that's very um, precise. <laughs> I sent the email about 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, <laughs> That's that's remarkable that in three years, you know, you're on your way to the end of the, of the alpha phase. Yeah. So we'll get into the story of what you were looking for early on. But yeah. Right. Well, listen, the patients are waiting, right? Hmm. Luckily, my grandfather is still with us. And the goal here is to trade to help with my grandfather's situation. So I need to get this to the market as soon as possible. Um, yeah. Patients are waiting. <laughs> Gotcha. All right. One other background question for you, Mustafa. So uh, you and I are both based in Baltimore. I mentioned you're another local company. Um, yeah. Why are you based in Baltimore? And yeah. um, just, you know, how's it, how's it going? All right. So this is actually a cool story. So, all right. So I was finishing up my, my bachelor's degree. I was, I was in Germany and I was an Iraqi refugee, right? The thing you need to know about refugees is they don't give you visas. So if you're there, just travel as much as possible because chances are if, if you go back home after like whatever the time time is done, you're not going to be able to travel again. So I pack up my bags. I rent a, a car. It was like a little hatchback. And I start traveling through Europe, every single corner of Europe, pretty much. My favorite spot was Monaco. So of course, know, just to draw a picture of Monaco, you have this beautiful people. Um, but then you walk and you see all of this, this, this Mediterranean, I don't know, like these boats and yachts. And like, it was so cool to see just walking by there. And I was like, this is where I want to live. <laughs> but then, you know, forgot about it. Next year, 
I started working, but I decided, you know, maybe I want to move to the U.S. I wanted to know where exactly I was going to live in the U.S., so we did a road trip. So we started in Philly, and we just drove around Jersey, whatever, New York, and all that stuff. Came to Baltimore, and the Inner Harbor reminded me so much of Monaco that I said, like, I want to live here. <laughs> so, so I remember we stayed at a hotel on Live Street, and I just loved the Inner Harbor. I loved the lights. I loved the energy. Um, so when I then decided to do a PhD, I was like, all right, I'm going to Baltimore. Let's see what universities uh, are in Baltimore. So here we are, 10 years later. Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what, a, what a great story. And then for our global audience, yeah, you can live in Baltimore. It's a quarter million dollars for a row house. You can walk down the street and you're right there in, in Monaco, basically. 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 Yeah. We just need a casino. <laughs> Got it. All right. So um, thank you for that background, uh, Mustafa. And um, by the way, we do have casinos. So, you know, we kind of have it all here. <laughs> we, actually, yes, you're right. You're yeah. Right. We, and we had the Grand Prix, I think, came through uh, a couple of years ago. It, it might have been called something. It wasn't F1. I think it was something else. But um, <laughs> anyways, we're trying. I'm trying. Um, all right. So the podcast is called MedTech Speed to Data. We have a lot uh, of our audience that's a mixture of global, uh, I'll call it entrepreneurs, people that are l- trying to launch new product ideas at global companies. And of course, startup, startup companies that are fundraising and de- developing their products in some pretty he- steady headwinds, I would say, these days with uh, the financing. We'll get into that a little bit later in our, in our lightning round. So what we want to focus on is, is what data were you looking for early on, let's say 2000, 2021, um, mm-hmm. to convince you, you know, to, to proceed, you know, with this venture. And I think you described the, the pressing clinical need. I think we, we can all agree that the, yeah. the leading killer in U.S. hospitals, 25% of, of those causes begins with UTI. So I guess I'm interested more, maybe from a, from a technical perspective, what you're willing to share, A, yeah. about your measurement, and B, you were like, let's just go, go forward. So what data were you looking for, and how did you collect that data? Right, so... So, I mean, you kind of told me half the story, right? Because you know there's a clinical need, but you need to understand it very well. So the most important thing for any startup founder to look at is the clinical need, because otherwise you would be working for five, six years on product that actually is not a need. Um, the second piece, and I remember, so the first check that I got was from Tedco, right? So this is... You know, uh, on the tail end of the pandemic, I'm in my basement building with with Kevin, and um, finally had something that we could test, and and we, we got in touch with our UMB um, collaborators, like, hey, we're ready. We ran 15 samples, and the device was like spot on with 13 of the 15. And I remember I just went back home and I texted, uh, actually, I, I emailed uh, the inve- the one investor that we had, and I was like, hey, this is unbelievable. Today is the most important day. <laughs> in the history of this company. Um, so, so can you please tell me how I could get more money so I could take this to the next stage? So that was the first data point that this actually, this is not stupid. This actually will work. Uh, we just needed, you know, a lot more rigor with it. Yeah. So, so just to be uh, explicit there, so you built some, hacked together some prototypes yes. and ran some tests against the control and it, it yeah. gave equivalent results. 13 out of 15 samples, we were spot on. With two samples, there was, well, it was blood samples, actually, so it's more complicated. But it was like the other two samples, they had so much hemolysis, so like we could not even see anything. The device just failed, which, you know, we had, you know, there's so much more innovation. We have a patent to fix that now. But, but you know, it was like, this works. This is not a bad idea. That was right. like... Yeah. So one of the things that always uh, trips up, you know, key text clients is like, okay, you can prove it once, but does it work at its limits, right? Whatever those limits are, maybe uh, variation in sample and variation in environmental conditions. So I guess were you sort of just kind of ignorant of that and just wanted to kind of roll with it? Or were you, it was the measurement, uh, the modality robust enough in your mind where you were confident to proceed? I was confident enough to raise a pre-seed round, address some of the problems that I saw in the next generation of the tabletop uh, device. I was not ready to raise a lot of money because I knew the risk was just ridiculously high. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was enough for me to, you know, say, "Hey, angel investor, can I have 50k?" Um, mm-hmm. At that point, that yeah. kind of thing. 
maybe before we get into the data you're looking to collect today, just talk a little bit about your team, the size of your team, what's the makeup of the team? So the team is eight at, at this point. So Kevin, Kevin Tryon and I co-founded the company, but you know, people told us that we don't have the experience. So we started adding more experienced people. So for example, we have uh, Rick Faint, he's our CFO, but he had six exits as a CEO and CFO. So he kind of advises us on on daily basis on things that you know he's seen. Uh, we have uh, Scott O'Brien, who's our chief commercialization officer. You introduced me to to Scott, That's right. <laughs> and you know with Scott with his experience, especially in this sector, has been been amazing. Um, we have two full time engineers and two full time scientists, just to to get everything tested properly to you know, all the grant writing with all the, the scientific innovation that we are yet to do. So yeah, it's a, it's a very good team. We've come a long way. Come a long, yeah. long way. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's, it seems like you, you're striking the right balance of, we're segueing by the way, of uh, like executive, um, you know, ownership of, of clear verticals like technology, financials, you know, commercial, and balancing that with, you know, the team that's doing, you know, some of your, Engineering kind of bench bench work, the assay work, and it sounds yeah. like you're using that team to apply for other grants. Um, so it's, it seems like you're designing this you know appropriately for where you are. Right, and we're designing for the next 25, 30 years. Uh, we understand that you know UTI is a pressing matter right now, but we understand that blood is also a need. All these panels are a need, and then beyond that, we are having deals with major uh, healthcare facilities to provide us with. 25 years worth of cultures so we could see what data we see to create that deeper understanding of the problem for the long term for long term solutions not just you know what we're working on right now yeah so th- let's talk about the data that you're collecting currently in your in your alpha phase so so obviously from key tech you know we're developing the prototype and improving from an engineering perspective that uh, you're meeting the specs that uh, we jointly sort of define but can you talk a little bit about some of your Maybe your partnerships you have. I think there's a MedStar partnership, perhaps. And yeah. you know, what data are you hunting for now? So you know, especially with UTI, there's so many populations, right? So, uh, so like you're talking about, uh, you know, like women get it the worst, but there are like smaller populations, like the elderly, like my grandfather. Uh, you have patients with neurogenic bladder syndrome, and each one of this population has its own champion in the field. So the MedStar. A uh, partnership that you just mentioned, it's with Dr. Suzanne Gro, who's amazing, and she's one of the smartest people uh, that work on addressing UTI. She works with neurogenic bladder syndrome patients. This is the toughest patient population we will ever encounter. Why? Because they have polymicrobial infections. They have two or three types of infections. Some of them are catheterized. Sometimes we collect the urine from the catheter bag, which is nasty, Right. So the fact that our test uh, performed over 90% sensitivity and specificity was like, we're ready to actually invest, you know, tens of millions of dollars to, so this technology could get in the hands of doctors and, of course, to benefit patients. Got it. Got it. So transitioning to the, the future then, I mean, you, you're rolling out with, with UTI. Um, it seems like that's probably the most straightforward sort of test slash yeah market gap that you, you want to fill, but looking to the future, can you talk a little bit more about some of these other sample types and, and maybe how you're designing your platform today to kind of be ready for some of these other sample types beyond urine? Right. So my vision is to have like the main instruments. So, so you have, a, you have a, like a, a universal system that can measure any sample type. And for every type of sample, because it has to be processed differently, you have a module. Right? So for urine, you know, working on this right now, the same exact cartridge will be used for CSF. CSF is like one of these, like, like meningitis is so bad, but the market is so small that it has not been addressed properly. So we plan to address that as our um, very next panel. The third panel, which I'm very passionate about just because of my experience with blood, is the bacteremia panel. So sepsis is really, really bad. Many people die. A patient would go to the emergency department, they get two, three, four antibiotics that are broad spectrum. In the process of trying to save the patient, you're destroying the microbiome, which is important for immune systems. And so it's just, I think the treatment of sepsis is broken. 
and this has to be addressed, we need to give the patient one antibiotic that, that is narrow and will target the specific infection they have. 270,000 Americans die every single year because of sepsis. And if we could give all of them the proper antibiotic, this could be cut in half. Uh, so that will be our third panel. The fourth panel is our wound exudate or, you know, effluent. And that is mostly, you know, um, you don't know if you could operate on some of these patients because if the, if the wound is infected, um, this could cause sepsis if the, uh, you know, bacteria goes into bloodstream and, and all that. So that would be the fourth panel. Got it. But the sky is the limit. We could do virtually any panel as long as we can process the sample, which mm -hmm. is the complicated part, it seems. So how many different antibiotics are part of your, your panel, right? I mean, because I know there's two main ones that are being administered, but like there's more yeah. than that. So how many are in your, in your test? So each population requires different antibiotics. So because our first rollout will be to urology and, and, and OBs, we have five antibiotics per cartridge. But then once we go into, uh, for example, even patients with neurogenic bladder syndrome, the cartridge will have to be adjusted a little bit. Uh, we have data that addresses 25 different antibiotics, over 13 different types of bugs that we encountered so far. Another question for you: You know, how long is this test, and 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 where? You know, based on your market research, like what are you looking to charge for this yeah. test? The test takes an hour, end to end, directly from patient sample. The goal here is to charge fifty dollars per test, and. We're working with, with a firm to help us with, with reimbursement. So we charge 50, the physician will get reimbursed 100. So um, we're making money, the physician is making money on by ordering tests, and more importantly, the patient is getting better, right? So it's, mm -hmm. that makes it sustainable. Yeah. Um, for hospitals, again, it's the same thing, it's 50, but they work with a bundle, and the idea here is to shorten the stay of the patient. We did, we did a health economics study, if we shorten by the stay for the patient that received wrong antibiotics by one day, we're saving uh, the hospital per site a million dollars. So if you think about like a hospital like MedStar with like whatever, 11 sites, it's $11 million for the whole hospital system, which is really a uh, good value for them. Wait, you mean over a few patients, it's a million dollars a day? It's the patient's all the patients that received the wrong antibiotic, right. had they received the proper antibiotic for every day that you're, you, you, know, you shorten the visit for, it's a million dollars over the population. Yeah, that's remarkable. Uh, well, Mustafa, be best of luck as you uh, navigate uh, these waters here. But it looks like you got a great team in place. Yeah, great team and great partners, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> appreciate that. So... Um, our, our audience is, is excited to get into the, the final final stage of this episode. We, we call it the lightning round. And uh, I have a surprise guest to come yeah. on the podcast. This is the first, first time we've had a surprise guest come on. Uh, my colleague Lauren is here. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <I'm running>. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, yeah. thanks, for, thanks for coming on. I know uh, you know Mustafa and Aztec uh, very well, uh, having um, worked with them over the last year plus. Yeah. Um, Lauren, do you want to get going asking some questions for Mustafa? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me, Andy. And good to see you, Mustafa. Good to see um, you. So, you know, we've, I guess I was reflecting back. We met a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and I've witnessed firsthand the growth um, and progress that you guys have made, which is pretty remarkable. So as I ask these lightning round questions, just reflect on that growth and, and I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are sitting um, today where you were a few years ago and could really take your advice and run with it. So jumping right into it, what advice would you give for a CEO or founder um, that's just starting fundraising? Uh, well, first of all, good to see you, Lauren. Uh, for yep. the uh, audience of the podcast, Lauren is my favorite um, <laughs> key tech um, employee. Um, <laughs> Andy is number 17. Um, <laughs> so the, the advice is simple, right? Build something people want or need and money will come. When you are trying to fundraise, no one will invest in a, at a single point. So 
as you're building, when you don't need money, take out an investor out for coffee or beer or whatever, tell them about your work and say, hey, I'm not trying to raise money. I'm just trying to get your advice or I'm trying to get to know you, your work or whatever. But that, because then as they track you, you know, so that's, you're, you're creating that line. So they have kind of a reference point and see your progress. At the end of the line, at the second point, the likelihood of them investing is much, much higher. I learned that the hard way because as a scientist, I was trying to stay in the lab, except that if you, if you meet the right people at the right time, when you don't need money, you meet with them again when you do need money. They want to be a part of that journey. Create FOMO, in other words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say the same, same applies in sales too, right? It's like the yeah. best time to meet you know, uh, a customer or a potential customer is like when you don't, you know, when you're not like dying for, you know, revenue or projects and um, they come back later. You come back later and you've kind of built that foundation, the relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely see that like relationship building is key and it, it shows how you, how you've leveraged your relationships to, to really get Aztec going. So what about your team or getting an advisory board together? What, what advice would you give to uh, a CEO for, for building their team or advisory board? One, don't overhire. Do not hire your friends you know, from the get-go. That's, that's really important. And the second thing is be careful who your advisor is because some people might be very successful in the corporate world um, but they might ask you to laminate your business plan and get a waterfront office uh, when, you know, as a startup, you need to be very frugal. And, 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 and so that just be careful who your advisor is. You'll hear all kinds of advice. Make sure it's, it, when it comes from someone, this person has been in your shoes. Um, so that's why as advisors, same thing, get people who are as excited as you to solve the problem because you'll have bad days. I mean, it's really all the time. This is just how it is with startups. But if they're as excited, can you lift each other up? Try to hire A players uh, because because in the end you are giving. So when Essex started, this was mine, my baby alone. No one's allowed to touch it. But slowly, I had to you know give people responsibilities to take care of this baby. And now I'm um, you know uh, I can focus on building the business as opposed to you know. The other parts, like running the samples every single day, right and grand. So slowly things uh, progress that way. But there is no recipe, by the way. There is no recipe. Yeah. There's no recipe. Except for yeah. P-Tech. That's the recipe. I mean, I think you did such a good job. Your team is stellar. So it's like, do you have any advice for, I know you said, you know, don't hire your friends, be selective. But like, yeah. when I look at the team that you have put together, they're all rock stars and they add value. So it's like, you know, where did you find them? How did you find them? Like, can you add a little bit more there? So, well, with, with Kevin, we worked together for three, four years. And uh, I hired my friend. And it was amazing because Kevin does not hold back. So yeah. these difficult conversations were easy with him. The next employee was Courtney. I really needed someone in the lab. I was having coffee with one of my advisors. I saw someone was sitting there with a slide that said capstone project. And I said, Hey, do you want a job? Uh, she said, no. But then all of these chemical engineers started like connecting with me on LinkedIn. And I, I DM every single one of them say, Hey, do you want a job? So I had like 15 interviews lined up and Courtney really stood out because uh, she did really, she really did her homework. She asked very good questions. So that's Courtney. Uh, BioBuzz. I love these guys. They got us. You know, our rock star scientist, Chris. Um, yeah, um, we, I really just, I'm lucky. Quick question for you more specifically on the on the board side. I guess, what does that look like and, you know, hiring for that? Because I think that's a, a crucial part of these, uh, being a startup, right? Um, yeah, we're actually in the process of building the board. So right now, three of Essex employees are on the board and then uh, two of our investors were looking to kind of move things around. And we are looking for someone with fem health experience to come on the board. So if, hey, if any of your listeners think they're qualified, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. That would be, that'd be, really, uh, that'd be really amazing. Uh, we want to add that, that kind of voice because women, I think, are underrepresented 
in, in, in technology and especially like when it comes to care, it's, it's, it's less out there, less funded. So we're trying to fill that gap as well. One of the biggest supporters of Aztec has been George Davis. So he's on our board. Our biggest investor who's from Anna Capital, his name is Engel, he's on our board as well. Nice. So good mixture, but you're still hunting for, for others. Yes, absolutely. Last of the lightning round, and then we might just throw some random ones in there. I don't know. <laughs> um, what advice just generally would you give to an entrepreneur that's starting a new company? Unless you're obsessed with the problem you're trying to solve, don't, don't become an entrepreneur. It's easier to deal with setbacks when you're obsessed with the problem. Uh, there are going to be setbacks, and they get easier over time. But especially in these, like in the first year, every setback, well, you'll stay up all night thinking about it. So you have to be really like dedicated to solving the problem. Um, there's this concept in um, kickboxing or boxing, desynthetization, which is you are getting punched, but you still have to like, <laughs> you still have to perform your strategy. And, and the same thing as a founder, you'll get punched. People are going to call you stupid. Um, fundraising, right? You see all the good news on fundraising. People don't tell you that it took 100 meetings to get the first yes. Um, so you just have to be ready for, for, for all that stuff. Um, also, be very humble. Surround yourself with smarter people because people will tell you you're very smart, but surround yourself with smarter people. And um, one big advice is you'll get invited to all kinds of events, Tequila Tuesday and White Shirt Friday, do not go to all of these events. Be very, very selective uh, because in the end, if you want to network, build something that people need and the right people will come to you. And and yeah, so that's that's kind of quick advice. Yeah. That's great. That's, I mean, that's super valuable. I think, you know, we've heard um, a lot of those things before, but it's nice to have it like in one concise message. Um, so I think that'll be really valuable for our entrepreneurs listening that are you, you know, two and a half, three years ago. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. One other question I had is uh, just how have you enjoyed working with Keytech and the Keytech team? You guys, we, we very quickly became like partners and friends. Uh, <laughs> so it's really, I'm very comfortable with you guys. Um, Honestly, I think, Lauren, I told you this, but uh, we were looking at different firms. But then when I walked into KeyTech, met with you, I think it was Andy, were you, or maybe you were there as well. It's just the confidence that I saw, saw on your eyes was just like, yeah, this, these are the right people to, um, to hand my baby to. Um, and, and really, that's where, where yeah, I, I love working with you guys, really. I'm very confident. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, I saw something, I think it was like a TED Talk or something, recently that was like uh laughter improves efficiency and like a work workplace and everything and i was thinking about uh some of our status update calls with aztec and how frequently we're laughing and it's like you know we're making really great progress but it's just a really enjoyable partnership so it's awesome yeah and um on that there's a quick announcement recently we had a poll on linkedin to decide whether we should etch a bacteria or our office dog on on, on our PCBs and Lilo one. So our dog okay. will be on Yay. <laughs> You heard it here first. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to tease that. You have to watch the whole episode to get the, uh, <laughs> get the result. Yeah, that was cute. Thanks, thanks for posting that. Uh, yeah. Mustafa, one other, one other, you keep talking about uh, the baby uh, being the company, but you also... Uh, have a child or more than one, I, I, I don't know. But I thought your, uh, it'd be worth sharing, you know, some of the sacrifices you've made as a, as a young family to also make this, um, make this yeah. rocket go. So talk about that. Yeah, um, it's really hard not to take your work home when you're a founder because, um, again, there are so many setbacks, there's so many problems that you have to fix on a on daily basis. One of, I mean, I don't know, but... Uh, my son, one of his first words was Alamar Blue. This is the reagent that we use um, in our system. So That's uh, not normal. <laughs> that's not normal. Uh, my daughter has, she's seven months old. She has been in so many meetings with Lauren, uh, yeah. right? Because I, yeah, every Thursday I, you know, I used to stay with her home. So that's when I met Lauren. Um, but she also has been in an FDA meeting. What I learned 
being a parent is you will always feel guilty. It's never enough time with your kids. And being a founder does not make that any easier. Um, but hmm. I, I would like to think that it is for the greater good. Um, we're building, people will need, we'll use it and we'll save lives. Oh, two kids. There you go. Two kids. Oh, <laughs> so cute. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's it. Mustafa, thank you so much for coming on. Lauren, thank you for being the surprise guest, yeah. guest co-host. <laughs> this is amazing. I love it. I loved it. Um, and uh, until next time, everybody, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to MedTech Speed to Data, a key tech podcast. Join us each month for more ways to get the right data faster to inform critical decisions. Find additional resources on our website, keytechinc.com. If you like this episode, don't forget to subscribe and please leave a review on iTunes whenever you listen. Thanks.